Welcome. This is Power Trading Radio Live, fueled by Online Trading Academy. For more information, visit powertradingradio.com. Now, here's your host, Merlin Rothbell. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Power Trading Radio. Merlin Rothbell with you for what is definitely a Monday. For those of you who might follow the comic Garfield many, many years ago, he hated Mondays. And I'm kind of starting to hate this Monday, too. Not from a market perspective. I thought the markets were phenomenal today. Hopefully, you guys made some money to the south side with the wonderful 3% sell-off. But the Mondays have taken the shape of just computer malfunctions here in studio. My computer, thank you, Mr. Gates and Microsoft, decided to say, you know what? We want to do a reboot, a restart, update everything, and I'm guessing we won't have any charts or even the ability for me to see comments and questions on our YouTube channel today. So, going to be a very uh, vanilla show. We're going analog today. No, no graphics or nothing. So, we'll see how this one goes. Should be rather interesting for today's show. Uh, all right, we can start off with the elephant in the room, which is the giant market sell-off we had today. Of course, going into the weekend, I think you guys could probably go back and look at the markets and look at the charts as we go into Friday and the results from Friday to Monday and see that over the past couple of months, Friday is not the worst day, but the Monday, usually we see the global impact of this coronavirus and just news impacting negatively on Monday morning. We saw the gap down already start last night when futures open on Sunday evening and they continue to drift down starting off with a much lower open today and then we continue to sell off. Now, unfortunately, I don't have a chart to show you here because I'm at 4% on my updates, which means I'm probably going to be nowhere near complete by the time we finish this show. Uh, what was interesting over the past couple of months has been this. We've talked about it many times on the show. We have continued to shrug off any, any semblance of negativity in the markets. So some company reports bad earnings. Okay, they're down for a day, maybe two, and all of a sudden they just rip to all-time highs. We're seeing just a very small basket of stocks carry this market further and further up. Really, again, shrugging off any worry of international conflict, of, of viruses, whatever. All of a sudden, today's news is a little bit different. I actually have a friend in Milan that was posting on her Facebook page last night that they're quarantined in Milan. That like they really everything's kind of shut down. They're not letting people leave. It's like this is rather interesting. You know, Milan's not the major uh, industrial manufacturing area, although there is some manufacturing in the outskirts. It's the fashion capital, though, right? Then you also have you know China and more and more coronavirus issues. Of course, again, we talked on the weekend edition with John O'Donnell that who knows what on earth is going to be coming out of China with regards to accurate factual news. Bottom line is it's not good, and it's that VUCA, that uncertainty that's causing these market ripples. Now, what was noteworthy about today, and I'll run through some numbers here, uh, obviously the, the biggest downside today from our top seven markets was the 10-year. We're down over 6% on that 10-year. We are now at pretty historic levels. 1.37 is where we ended that 10-year yield. Let me make sure I got my numbers right. 1.377 to be precise. That was a slide of 6.39%. So all in all, very ugly for the 10-year, and that was your worst. But right, these indexes are just right there as well. So it was crude oil. Crude oil was down 3.82% today, closing at $51.34. You had the uh, NASDAQ down 3.7. You had S&P down 3.35. Bitcoin down 3%. Russell down 3% as well. And then the shining star of it all, creeping ever so close today to our $1,700 target, which may actually uh, jump even higher here soon. We had gold today, finishing the day at 1,661. That was a gain of 0.78% or about $13 per ounce per gold. Now, that may not seem like a lot. Of course, if I could show you a chart here, which I really want, maybe you should draw the charts on paper as we progress through today's show. Thank you, technology. We become so dependent on it. Uh, that was by far your best performer, but again, that goes to that global uncertainty that's out there. Now, back to my earlier comment about the market shrugging off worry and doubt. If you look at today's intraday chart, and of course, I will have to let all of you do that yourselves today because I don't have a computer to run. Um, we were trending down most of the session right around noon Pacific time. We saw a pretty aggressive rally, and I was thinking to myself, okay, here we go. This is the market doing what it's done so well over the past few months, which is just, okay, we've had a down day. Let's erase those gains and show a nice positive pattern and really move things to the upside. And it started to. It was actually a pretty nice move, and all of a sudden it gave it up and just started to sell off again, meaning that those buyers just don't have the confidence going into the close that this is going to be a higher market going forward. So it was... Um, a pretty interesting change right at the very end of the trading session. I don't know if you guys can uh, pull up on your own charts. Um, yeah, it, and it's predominantly this coronavirus, just disruption. It's really what it is. The number of deaths out there, 
I don't know. I, I, I couldn't tell you whether it's, it's uh, 10 people or millions at this point because I just don't have accurate information. I'm not on the front lines, but it is disruption. Now, here's the interesting thing. If we take a look at what's happening right now, it's the anticipation, almost like the anticipation of Tesla dominating the car world is why we've seen that stock price skyrocket. They haven't done it yet, but that's the anticipation. The anticipation with regards to coronavirus at this point is it's going to create further disruption. It's interesting, but it's not really about the death toll. I know not to sound heartless, but that's not what the markets are reacting to. The markets are reacting to the disruption of global transactions, of shipments from China to the U.S. I've talked to a lot of friends over the weekend that are in business with international markets, uh, some in manufacturing, some in services, and they're all extremely concerned about not being able to get the products or services they need from China because of shutdown transportation issues. So this will progress. I think it's actually uh, not getting better as most have predicted. I think it's probably going to continue to escalate until we see either a outright cure for it. Who knows? You guys might be conspiracy theorists and think that this all came from some lab in China or some other area. Whatever, it, wherever it came from, it is what it is and it's disruption. Now, we are just finishing up an earnings season right now, so we really don't get all of the data as we speak. What's interesting will be next earnings season, and we can really see how this hit the bottom line for U.S. manufacturers, U.S. businesses, and is it going to be that bad? All, all in all, today we only had a 3% down move. If you look at the big picture here, 3% is nothing on the grand scheme of things. I would, be, uh, I would not be surprised to see this continue as a moment where we do get a bigger pullback. I, John O'Donnell and I talked about this last weekend and the weekend before, where 10% would actually be healthy for the markets. You have to take a pause and breathe before you get that next leg if you're running a you know, sprint or something. So um, while all of this is focused around the coronavirus, there was nothing out there today from an economic data perspective that should have derailed or, or hurt these markets. So this is purely global disruption from coronavirus out there. And um, hopefully some of you did fairly well in today's market. It was an aggressive one. Uh, unfortunately, I, like I said, I have no charts here to show you, which makes me it's frustrating. I could look it up on my phone and just point the screen at you, but that's not going to help you out. Uh, definitely a major disruptor out there today. I expect that to continue. I have um, a bunch of short positions open right now. I have 70 call op or sorry, 70 put options on various market indexes. Uh, I'm in the Nasdaq. I'm in the S and P. I'm also in the Russell. And I really was contemplating closing out the activity or closing out those trades today because if you look at the S&P 500, we came down aggressively, very aggressively to those lows that we saw back in January, almost like putting in a double bottom. And I thought about closing it out, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm taking a bit of a gamble here in the expectation that this might be one of those moments that continues to cause further downside movement, that the panic selling isn't done. And the only reason I stayed in was basically the way that we finished the day. We didn't have that big rally back up. Uh, if you look at the longer term time frames, especially the monthly, now we still have a week to go, but on the monthly time frame, you're looking at a gigantic shooting star, which if we go back to candlesticks, one of my favorite patterns out there, the candlestick uh, for the shooting star is a very negative one. It definitely is uh, indicative of downside movement, especially after we've had such a parabolic move in most of these major market indexes. So that's where we stand out there today, guys. Um, Hopefully you capitalize on some of that downside movement. We've been talking about how there is the potential for the black swan event. When we come back, I'll talk to, uh, this is Russ. Russ, you, uh, you asked this specific question um, regarding hedging. I'll, I'll read it out in advance so you guys can think about it a little bit on the break. Uh, and today is actually an appropriate show for it because I don't have a guest today. Scott Greer was supposed to be on, but he can't make it today. So it's just me with no computers for the show. Should be fun. All right, here's the question. Uh, Russ, thank you for sending this one in at Power Blast. Of course, you can send in your questions at powertradingradio.com. Click that Power Blast button. I will be looking on my phone here to pull those up. And TJ is actually sending me over the comments and questions that you guys are sending in the YouTube chat or trying to on my phone. So if you see me looking at my phone repeatedly throughout the show, no, I'm not waiting for uh, some girl's text. I'm waiting for, well, TJ's text. All right, uh, Russ's question. He says, can you go through the difference between hedging your portfolio and buying protection for your portfolio? For example, if you're in a downturn and expect the market to turn around, which would you pick? I can start off by just saying I'm extremely biased with regards to this one, and I'll explain why after a quick break. So send on your comments and questions. We'll get to all those right after a short break. What if you knew the income strategies professional investors used? The strategies designed to generate active income from the financial markets. After all, 
no one's going to care more about your money than you. I learned that I can be in control of my 401k. I used to work for money, now I have my money working for me. With the right training and guidance, you can learn the skills to become a more confident investor and make your money work harder for you. Want to find out what's possible for you? You can, as long as you're willing to take the first step and call OTA today. Call for your free tickets right now, and you'll also receive a free professional insider's kit loaded with lessons from some of our top instructors on topics like enhancing your retirement strategy, capital preservation, and income generation. The Professional's Insider Kit makes it so you can get started right now. Call 888-304-8723 or visit us online at tradingacademy.com and schedule your free class today. Click is something I wish I had when I started because it facilitates the learning process a lot quicker. This is not about taking many trades, it's about taking the right trade. It helps me save myself from myself. It's just a revolutionary educational tool. It propels you through the learning curve. The biggest shock for me is the level of innovation that happens within the company and it's continuing. It's just perfect in this new century of trading. Everyone's on the same side, and I think that's what I love about it more than anything else. Helping each other, supporting each other, all with the same objective. Again, wonderful. There's no mountain high enough that the, the leaders in this organization won't climb for their students. They'll, they'll just never give up. It can only help. It can only make one a better trader. Gives you the, one of the most valuable things we all have, and that's time. Welcome back to Power Trading Radio Live with your host, Merlin Rothfeld, and today's special guest. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Power Trading Radio. Merlin Rothfeld with you for your manic Monday, crazy Monday over here where we're going to have zero visuals. So for those of you listening to the podcast, well, you get the exact same show that our visual digital viewers at YouTube are normally getting. Of course, they get to see my ugly mug, which unfortunately is probably worse. So the podcasters, you get the better job today. Uh, before we took a break, I was talking about a question from Russ out there. It says, on an appropriate show, probably not Monday or Tuesday since there are currency shows. I am not doing a currency show today. I'm doing a whatever show today because my guest uh, couldn't make it on the program today and I have no computer. He says, can you go through the difference between hedging your portfolio and buying protection for your portfolio? For example, if you are in a downturn and expect the market to turn around, which would you pick? This is a matter of personal preference. I am extremely biased on this one because I am a bit more, I don't want to say in tune with the markets than most because it sounds very condescending. I uh, apologize if that comes across that way. I don't think that, it, I, I would not hedge my positions in any condition. I would either close my positions and make money when that was going to drop, or I would maintain those positions. Because for me, trading is fairly binary. It's saying it's either going to go up or it's going to go down. And yes, we could be using option strategies and making money when things go sideways, but my brain really thinks more in the, it's going up or it's going down. So for those that might not know, let's talk about what hedging is. Hedging is basically looking at a mix of assets or taking an instrument that might act as a, a buffer uh, to soften the blow of a market downturn. I'll give you an example. So let's say you're long the S&P 500 and you say, you know what, I just don't want to close out my positions. I want to maybe open up some positions which might soften the blow if that S&P drops 10%. So what you would do is you'd be going and looking for inversely related assets. One that comes to mind, which is not inversely related right now, uh, but has been historically, would be the U.S. dollar. So let's say you're holding SPY or the S&P 500 and you say, I want to hedge it. I might go buy some, S uh, some dollars, U.S. dollars. Why? Because if the S&P drops 10%, well, maybe the dollar is going to rally 8 or 9 or 10 or 15%. It's inversely related. So you're offsetting the losses. Here's why I, I'm not a fan personally of that. Actually, let me rewind. As someone who's a long-term investor, I think that this may have some position, uh, some place in your portfolio, especially from a diversification over time perspective. Let's say, for example, you are a 401k holder, an IRA holder, you've got a big portfolio and you just don't want to manage it all the time. You should already be building in components into that portfolio, which will act as somewhat of a hedge because your biggest risk to a long-term portfolio is taking a big hit, especially right in your retirement when you need it. So, 
I think that in that case, you might be looking at standard models like uh, a sector rotation model, which will show you when one particular asset is doing very well, there's others that are underperforming, and there's a rotation of assets. So right now, if you feel like all of a sudden markets are going to be going south, you might want to look at buying maybe more consumer staples per, per, for your portfolio or something like utilities, which generally perform better during market downturns. I say that with a giant asterisk, kind of like an Astros World Series trophy. There's always that little asterisk right there. And that asterisk is this. Let's say you bought a utility stock or you bought uh, a healthcare stock or you bought... Um, a consumer, you bought Johnson & Johnson, which historically will perform better in a market sell-off. When I say better, I don't mean positive. If the S&P drops, let's, as a whole, drops 10%, Johnson & Johnson's probably not going to rally, but it might only drop, let's say, 3 or 4%. It will drop, it, it should drop less than the overall market. That's why I don't like hedging. Because why would I want to set myself up personally in a position where I'm going to lose, but not as much? I'd rather not lose. I'd rather make money during those periods. So, Russ, to answer your question, uh, for me personally, I wouldn't do it. There are merits and times where you should. And of course, don't take my word for it. Do some research out there. I would rather go towards the protection side. And the protection side would say, instead of me finding something that's inversely related, I'm going to go and buy specific protection for that specific instrument. So for example, one of the things we teach extensively in Strategic Investor is let's use exchange traded funds as the basis for the portfolio. And we'll come up with a strategic asset allocation model so that we have a mix of different exchange traded funds that will offset risk, hedge if you will. The other side of that is saying, okay, now I have, let's say, this mix of five ETFs to represent a specific market spectrum that I'm using to target a desired rate of return for my portfolio. What I can do is if I'm looking at these markets right now and I go, man, I'm really concerned with the coronavirus or earnings or the election or Russia or whatever it is, and I think there's going to be a market crash, then I could go out there and I would buy outright market puts on SPY or whatever ETFs I was holding. Why? to capitalize on the downside move. It almost offsets any losses. And in many cases, if it moves far enough, fast enough, you'll make a lot more money than you would be losing, therefore a net gain. So that is, I would lean myself more towards the protection side. I will tell you that my current action in the marketplace, I'm not protecting and I'm not hedging. I'm going by what I think is going to move in the right direction. I mentioned to you guys that I'm long gold. I'm long gold because I think gold has a lot of upside potential. I'm long oil because I think oil has upside potential. I'm currently short, as I mentioned, the NASDAQ, the S&P, and the Russell because I feel there's downside potential. Notice I'm not holding long SPY thinking it's going to go up and protecting it with options. I'm, I'm removing that from the equation and saying I'd rather deploy my capital and make money on the directional move as opposed to hedge or offset. Now that's, that's my personal approach. That's the way that I go at it. There are merits and, and pros and cons to each way of doing it. Now, you had a second part here. You said, for example, if you're in a downturn and expect the market to turn around, which would you pick? That's a very interesting question because, one sec, as I read through. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. If you look at um, the market sell-off that we had today, you could make the argument that, that, that the S&P, if I could bring up a chart, I would obviously be doing that right now. But look at the daily chart of an S&P 500 if you have a trading platform out there. Today's activity came ripping down into a demand zone. I don't know how strong that demand zone is. For me personally, it's not that strong, but it is a demand zone. So what could you have done as today's market sold off or maybe even over the week on Friday if you thought we might see some issues going into Monday, you could be protecting yourself by capitalizing on that. Now, how would we do that? Number one, is going back to what Russ is saying here, which is just how would you capitalize on the move? Number one would be outright buying puts, right? And that, again, depends on your personal risk tolerance. The puts that I'm in right now are for April. So I've got a couple of months left before I, I am even getting concerned. I'll probably close those out mid-March um, and then maybe roll into some longer term ones down the road. That's buying those outright puts. Now, again, with the, when you're buying those puts, what am I risking? The amount of money that I paid for those puts. It could disappear altogether if I'm not out by that third week of April. The other way you could do it, if you thought that this market was going to sell off, come down to a demand zone, and then start to rally back up and continue this glorious uptrend we've been on for the better part of 11 years now, you could 
go out there and you could be selling puts. Now, selling puts basically saying, I would like to buy at a specific point. You know, today, I think we got, uh, you, you could look at the, the 321 options. Well, you could have been um, looking at the 321 options on the S&P and selling those puts, collecting premium and saying, if it gets down to 321, I wanted to buy anyway because that was a demand zone, right? But I could also be collecting that premium. So what in essence it's doing is actually letting me buy things a little bit cheaper than I would. Now, of course, there's a lot of factors to it here. Of course, today's activity with the S&P 500 was all over the place. There was a ton of volatility out there, so premiums are probably getting rather lofty today. Um, but those are some of the things that you could do in your portfolio. Again, hedging would be saying, I want to buy something that's inversely correlated to soften the blow to whatever is going to happen in my portfolio. If that's option number one that you're looking to hedge, I have a big question for you. If all the signs are telling you that the market's going to be going down through whatever analysis you've made and you feel like this market's going to go down, then why hedge? Why not just go close your positions long? Take the, take the tax hit if it's a tax hit. If it's an IRA or 401k, you don't necessarily have to worry about that. So just close it out. Pay the commissions. That little commission cost, now a lot of them are free, it's a no-brainer. Now you have peace of mind. You don't need to hedge at all because you're cash. And if the market drops 10%, your portfolio stays right where it's at. To me, that would be the safest thing to do. But some people want to stay in the market, so they'll buy a little bit of protection. So if the market does sell off, it softens the blow. I, I can't direct you guys on what to do. I'm not a financial advisor. Um, I don't have a CFP or anything like that. But from my experience, my personal one is I'd rather not sit there and watch my, my wealth bucket, my long-term portfolio, slowly start to decline in value, even though I'm hedged and protecting a little bit. I don't want to watch that thing drop at all. I want it to grow. So if I felt that this market was going to be selling off, I would do kind of the two things we talked about here with Russ. Number one, I would close out my long positions. I would be buying short uh, vehicles, whether those are inverse ETFs, that are going to move to the south side, or buying puts, selling some calls maybe, and betting that those markets are going to drop. If I was still bullish but felt like this was going to be a shorter term sell-off in the equity markets, what I could do is be go out there and sell some puts. Saying, all right, if the market drops, let's say the S&P, I want to sell, um, I want to sell the 300 puts on the S&P. Right? right now, the S&P is trading at 3,225. So that's another 225 points. Right? It was down 111 today. That was 3.71%. So if we sold off another 225, that would be about a 10% drop in the market. OK, that might be a great buy point. So I go out there and look at the 300 strike price for puts, and I could go and sell those puts, collect premium. Now, if I do that, what do I want? Do you want it to fall all the way down to 3,000 and you buy them, right? You exercise those options. Or you could say, I hope it just keeps going up because I've already sold those options or sold those put options at 300. I'm collecting a bunch of premium out there. I want them to expire worthless, right? You, and you pick the terms. Obviously, if you go a little bit further out, you're going to get some more premium. But, you know, I know uh, Brendan sent an uh, email yesterday or, or this morning. He said, look, I'm fine with weekly options. Great. I personally am not. It's not for me. I like to go three months out because um, I'm more of a buyer. So I want to go at least three months out so I have time on my side. If you're a seller, you, time, time is great, right? You want as little as possible because those will deteriorate even faster. So again, it really depends on what your goals and objectives are. For some of you, I may have gone way, way, way over your head and confused the heck out of you. Uh, if you would like to know more about options, which to me are the absolute Swiss army knife of the financial markets, you can learn more by going to Trading, uh, Trading Academy, go to PowerTradingRadio.com. On the front page there, you'll see two little buttons there that say free class. If you click on those links, type in your zip code, it'll tell you which of our 48 physical brick and mortar schools around the world are nearest to you. Each one has free classes, paid classes, community events, uh, and you can find out more information about options, stocks, futures, forex, commodities, uh, and much, much more. So I'd encourage you to do that one. All right, uh, I still am a long ways away from this computer even having some pulse. It's not going to be a graphic show today, so you guys get to hear me talk nonstop without a break to to do anything except commercial break. So that said, I'm going to take a quick commercial break. If you have a question, send it on in on our YouTube or PowerBlast us at PowerTradingRadio.com so that TJ can forward those on to me and I'll check my cell phone here on the break. Uh, oh, it's, it's sky's the limit, right? I got no guests today and we're just talking markets. If it needs a chart analysis, I can't help you there. So psychology might be a good one today or just your random questions. Feel free to send those on in. And we'll be right back after a short break. Learning this way is fine when the stakes are low. But when the stakes are high, you need to rely on skill, not just knowledge. 
At Online Trading Academy, you build your skill one step at a time. We teach our students to trade and invest with a strategy, not a hunch. You learn our methodology, then practice it. You get to make mistakes and ask questions, and watch instructors make live trades. Develop your skill the right way. Meet Mac. As a trader, he liked the signals that came from technical analysis tools, but they didn't help him find the best trades consistently, so he searched for a new approach. Mac attended Online Trading Academy's free class and discovered their core strategy, a trading methodology that spots when big banks are likely buying and selling, so everyday investors can too. Mac carved out a path to trade and invest with confidence, and so can you. Call 888-304-8723 or visit us online at tradingacademy.com and schedule your free class today. You're listening to Power Trading Radio live. Watch the show live or on the archive at powertradingradio.com and YouTube. Or download the podcast from iTunes or wherever fine podcasts are downloaded. Welcome back to Power Trading Radio, everyone, for our analog show. I love our show where we have no computer usage today. It's going to be all just me on screen. Yeah, it's so exciting. Glad I brushed my hair today, right? All right, uh, TJ is uh, messaging me questions that came up on our YouTube channels. Brennan says, what if someone sold Amazon? Wouldn't it be better if they held from 1997 until now? Well, as we all know, what about if, you know, John O'Donnell says, well, if I just asked out Sister Mary Knickknack back when I was in high school, life would be very different now. We can't go back and second guess everything. Of course, you're picking out an anomaly, aren't you, Brandon? You're picking out probably one of the greatest performing stocks in the history of mankind. So, yeah, of course, that would have been better. But what I'm referencing here isn't necessarily individual stocks, right? I think that Russ's question, uh, who sent the question about would you rather hedge or protect, is about a portfolio. So most of the time when you're building a portfolio, you're generally looking at exchange-traded funds to help in the diversification aspect out there. So yes, we can make the argument that, God, if you sold your Amazon, you'd be an idiot, right? Well, that's hindsight. You know, Who knew that this bookseller back in the 1990s would turn out to be the juggernaut that it is? I didn't think it was going to get that big. I mean, I remember when it was a bookstore. I remember when it was them and Books A Million. And if they didn't receive funding in 1999, um, I think early 2000, they got, they got money right like the week before the markets crashed. And that's what kept them afloat. If that didn't happen, there wouldn't be an Amazon today. It would be something different. It would not be Amazon. They'd be just bankrupt. So we can always do the what if scenario. But as a whole, we can't, as a trader or investor, focus and say, well, what if this for an individual one-off event? You have to look at the broader picture and say, I need to do this protection, whether it's hedging, whether it's using overall protection or being directional for the entire portfolio. Now, when it comes to portfolio investing, I think that hedging does serve a purpose. It has a place, especially for those who are very wealthy and have large portfolios. They can't really move stuff around very quick, right? At a certain point, you become too big as a trader or an investor to make split quick decisions. That's why I never wanted to be a money manager. I never wanted to be a hedge fund manager. I never wanted to have clients or call me all the time freaking out because when markets are like they are in the past 10, 11 years, you are your client's best friend. They love you. You're just making money. Of course, you're skimming off the top and getting your percentages, but hey, your clients are still making money, so they're happy. When the markets tank and we have a nice down year or a recession or a depression and you are the broker, and your clients are calling you all the time because I lost 10% this year. So, well, actually, sorry, Mr. Smith, you actually lost 14% because we had to take a 3% management fee and a 1% handling fee. So, you actually lost 14%. Uh, those types of things I just couldn't handle. So, I, I decided to move away from that. Um, the protection side to me is critical because if you're that big, again, you become it's too hard to move. I like the style that I have because I am a, I'm, the, I'm a small fish in the grand scheme of things. Very, very small fish. So I don't have a huge diversified portfolio because what happens is it becomes difficult for me to move that portfolio. It's kind of like saying you're in a, in, a, in a canal and you're trying to move a cruise ship. How quick is it going to be for that cruise ship to turn around and do a 180? It's going to take a little bit of time. But if I'm in a Zodiac boat, I can run circles around that thing, no problem. It's easier. Um, my students actually made fun of me in, when I was teaching over in Italy because I would trade live in front of them and I'm trading live real money, my account, no one else's. And it was interesting because I'd be trading and I'd be in, I'd be out. And all of a sudden I'd be long one minute and five minutes later I'm going short. And they're like, you're like a mosquito. I said, 
what do you mean? What do you, why are you calling me a mosquito? Like, well, because a mosquito is a little bit of an annoyance. And I was like, okay, that, I get it. You just kind of going in, going in, going in. And then uh, something happened to me a couple years later, which I probably have told you guys before, but since I don't have any charts or visuals today, I'm going to recant the story. Um, the mosquito story came back because I was, I was sitting there writing something, and I, I went like this to my neck, scratched my neck, and this gigantic mosquito flew off my neck, and it was so engrossed with blood, it couldn't fly, and I just smashed it, and it the rest of the story. The mosquito didn't make it, let's put it that way. And the reason is it got too greedy, it got too big, and it couldn't get away from me. To me, that's the same thing in trading. Like, I don't want to get to that point where I'm, you know, trading $50 million accounts because I will become immobile and my footprints will be everywhere. That's part of the strategy of Online Trading Academy is saying, how can we spot the footprints of the guys who have $50 million or $100 million? Because they have to leave a mark. I can move in and out of a market and no one will ever know that I was there except if you look at the ticker tape, you can see my exact transactions. But I'm not trading enough to influence. Um, so I don't see the need to hedge. I don't see the need really for protection. I'm just going to go outright and try to do what I have to do. If you're big enough, you're going to have to hedge uh, with different assets. And I think that the hedging perspective, as I mentioned, would really be for the big portfolio, for those who are uh, you know, the big cats that don't want to move money around. The protection side, I think, is a little bit more timely. I think the discussion we had with John, uh, was it John O'Donnell? Who was it we talked about the Black Swan event? Um, gosh. I don't remember. We had a discussion last week about the Black Swan event and like what you might do. I think it was with Steve Moses. We were talking about buying deep, 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 deep out of the money options. You know, like let's say right now you got the S&P uh, SPY trading at 322. Well, what if you bought some, um, uh, let's see, bought some puts at the 250 mark? So far out of the money. They're not really worth much right now. But if the market has more days like it did today, all of a sudden, those 220 options or 250 uh, options are going to skyrocket in value. And the only reason you'd be doing that is to protect yourself from that monster sell-off. Um, those are the types of things I'm looking at. All right. Uh, any other questions coming through, TJ? We got nothing out there? On both sites? You guys are quiet out there. Um, let's see. Uh, as you guys talk about S&P filling the gap. Uh, obviously, I'm assuming you're focusing on the gap fill to the north side. Now, that's an interesting one. You know, one of the things that they're talking about in the XLTs is going to be that gap. Of course, if you look at this market that has been so robust for so long, what do you think is going to happen? Most likely, you know, I'm actually, I'm, I'm really encouraged and excited for a bigger sell-off. Brendan said, uh, we'll see if this selling becomes a waterfall moment of 10% or another buy the dip. I think we're at that point right now of figuring out what that is going to be. Because if we break today's lows, which of course go back to lows from early January, I could see a very quick fall to that next demand level, which is not too far away, but then you start to see some bigger falls here, and that panic might start to uh, come in. I don't know if it's going to be that waterfall moment, but I certainly hope so. However, strip down my opinions or my positions or anything like that and just look at what has the market done. The market has had a pretty aggressive sell-off, and then it rallies and makes an all-time high. And that is probably not going to change until something is different. Right now, that is the level that we're at on the S&P. So, um, yes, I agree. I think this could be a potential buying opportunity. I think we could see it rally back up. If we close that gap that we established from Friday night through till uh, Sunday night, and if you're looking at SPY, you're not going to see that, right? You're going to see from Friday to Monday morning. That's a logical target. Closing that gap fill would not be uh, far-fetched, but... Then the question becomes, when we do close, or if we do close that gap, are you going to use that Friday close as a shorting opportunity? Or are you now going to be on the bullish trend and saying, hey, I think it's going to make all-time highs? That's one of those things you have to figure out as a trader right now to, uh, to start planning your positions. I, for one, do think that this uncertainty is going to persist. I think we're going to see more downside moves. But hey, I have been wrong before. But I got my money where my mouth is right now, so we'll see how that one pans out over the next few days. All right, uh, because I'm driving blind over here and I don't have any questions coming in, uh, there were a couple. He said, you know, do you have a buy point for the Aussie? I don't really. And unfortunately, I don't have a chart here for you. But the Aussie has just been looking down, 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 down for months. So I'm not really looking at a buy point. That said, if I remember correctly, there was a, uh, a demand zone that it's coming into from years ago, which might factor into it. But my bias on the Aussie dollar right now would still be to the short side because, as you guys know, the trend is your friend until the bend at the end. Uh, the other one from Leo, and I, unfortunately I don't have the chart to show you here. Uh, he says, I have a buy order on the USD JPY at 109.88 and a stop loss at 109.60. What are your thoughts? Um, I looked at this one earlier, and I actually I like it, but there's one, one glaring problem for me. Anyway, 
right now you're looking, if you're going long at 109.88 and your stop loss at 109.60, you've got yourself 28 pips worth of risk. Not too bad. That's fine. It's actually much lower than the daily ATR, right? Your daily ATR on, on um, USD JPY, if I remember, is right around 50 to 56, which means you're, you're half that. So your odds of being stopped out are pretty good. What I would do is I would actually jump in earlier. Why? Because right now, price on USD JPY is well above that 109.88 mark. So, if it's falling, and they can fall back down towards that demand zone that you have at 109.88, and it's actually a decent demand zone, there's one small thing that's 12 pips above it, which psychologically is a big thing. What is it? What is 12 pips above 109.88? That nice whole number of 110. Whole number psychology to me and many others uh, is a big part in trading and investing. And I would probably use my buy point there, maybe like even go 110.05 or 110.10 and give myself a little bit wider stop loss. I would have to tailor my position accordingly, but I would get in a little bit earlier because I'm guessing it'll probably bounce off that 110 mark. Um, I could be wrong and it could drop all the way to 109.88, but if you really want in, and if you notice the move that happened last week, it was a parabolic two-day run in USD JPY. It was a huge move up, thanks to that US dollar strength. But remember, the US dollar, the Dixie, has been on a great run lately. It's due for a pullback. So uh, I think you're seeing that right now. The last two days on USD JPY has been a pretty aggressive pullback. We'll see if it gets all the way down to that 110 mark or 109.88. All right, uh, that's it. Anything, any last minute ones coming in, TJ? Want TJ's? TJ's got one for me? All right. TJ's going to send over one more question here, and then uh, I'll wrap it up because I can't even show you guys what's going to be happening tomorrow. My, my calendars are all done. Everything is just its one of those shows out there. But, you know, it's funny. TJ goes, what should we do? Should we, should we, should we just scrap the show? I, like, I couldn't do that to you guys. I have to do the show. All right. Well, while TJ sends in uh, another question here, I'm going to read uh, or give our, our promo. Huh? I don't know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> TJ, TJ sent me some question. And I'm like, I don't know what that is. All right. Uh, before I, he sends this one back, uh, again, if you want to know more about options, we talked a lot about options today. And, and again, the utility from a hedging perspective, from a, uh, a, a protection perspective, there's a lot of different things we can do to with options. If you'd like to learn more, you can click that link at powertradingradio.com. Click the um, free class button. That'll tell you which campus is closest to you. Again, there's free classes, paid classes, community events, and much, much more. Uh, do you have a buy for Bitcoin? Oof. Uh, I don't know if I have a buy for Bitcoin right now. I'm, I'm a long-term, I'm a hodler. I, I think that long-term, you're basically going to look at uh, Bitcoin continue to rise in price much, much more. There are probably more um, profit potential cryptos out there other than Bitcoin, but I do think Bitcoin is just a long-term hold. So I guess ultimately you'd have to look at a chart and say, where's that buy point? I'm not adding any, any more Bitcoin to my portfolio at this point. I'm pretty much loaded up to where I want to be with it, but... Um, yeah, there we go. All right, uh, as far as time to buy Bit or time, uh, question came in, time to buy Apple. I don't know what the chart looks like right now. I, 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 don't, I don't follow Apple. So I will get to those couple questions. What I'll do is I'm going to scroll through your chat, and uh, we'll have this computer up and running. I'll stay here until this thing is fixed tonight. So hopefully uh, we will have the opportunity to show you more live charts. I apologize. I know some of you are so used to the visuals on the show. A little bit different when I got nothing to work with. But you know what? We made it work. All right. Uh, that will do it for today's show, everybody. Again, if you'd like to know more information about Online Trading Academy, how we can help you understand how these financial markets truly work, put the odds in your favor, and understand how institutions are moving in and out of these markets. As I mentioned, they're the big ones. They're the footprints that we want to be following and hopefully ride on their coattails and use their power to our advantage because we're the small guys. In the case of myself, I'm the mosquito. To learn more, click that link at powertradingradio.com. It says free class. Type in your zip code. That'll tell you all the information you need to know about the center that's closest to you. Until then, happy trading, everybody. I'll see you tomorrow with a full screen of charts and market updates. Take care. You're listening to Power Trading Radio live. Watch the show live or on the archive at powertradingradio.com and YouTube. Or download the podcast from iTunes or wherever fine podcasts are downloaded.